gentlemen and welcome to season three of is it really worth it podcast we're here today in birmingham at the ultimate fitness center i'd like to first start with thanking our sponsors s d paving from northampton for all your paving needs construction civil engineering traffic management sas security www.sas security uk for all your security needs and fortune favors productions for your media we're here this morning with a legend in his own time, Rad, a.k.a. Khan. How are you doing, Sean? Morning, Brad. How are you doing, mate? How are you doing, my man? Good to see you. How's things? Good to see you every time, mate. <laughs> not too bad, not too bad. Working on it. So let's start with the humble beginnings. Uh, I am basically grew up in Eastern Europe. Uh, came here when I was 12. Uh, went to a rough part of Birmingham, um, Hansworth where so like it was a, a culture change it was completely a different world but while i was growing up in eastern europe i was like one of the the youngest of uh, many cousins and they were all male so it was a bit like growing up in little sparta you know yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> being very skinny and being very um small uh it was hard because he had these expectations and when i look at sometimes like khabib growing up in so like uh, Dagestan, it's yeah. like very similar to that. I had one particular cousin that was always um, pushing me into um, fighting and things like that. So it was uh, it was a, a different world. It was a different, a world. competitive world. It is. It's 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 patriarchy. It's you know what, but the left tried to destroy patriarchy, but it forms you, it formats you, yeah. kind of makes you uh, aspire. And I think uh, all in all, it it. it gave me the strength that I tap and draw a lot of the times in later life. Yeah. You know. Uh, so you came when you were 12? Uh, about 77. It was 1977. Year after the hot summer. So you were reasonably set up as such before you came here. So when you came to Britain, what's the first thing you noticed about not just <laughs> lifestyles but the culture i'll tell you what really surprised me in eastern europe we have this thing called the draft and all the elders will say it could be 40 degrees centigrade the hottest day but don't open the car window it's cold you know the draft will get you the draft will get you and there i was in a, a little school in, in Hansworth called uh, uh, watford school it was and all the boys had shorts on and it was like september october and i'm thinking how is this possible? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so like two layers back home in Eastern Europe, yeah. like the, the under layer and the, the top trousers. And here, they were in shorts in the middle of winter, and I, I just couldn't get used to that. It was like very, um, so like a... But as a, from a, as a fighter's point of view, there must be a mat, because there is today, as many boxers are coming through, yeah. The, yeah. The, the gap. Yeah with western discipline compared to the eastern it, europeans it, it, it was, the way over there was there was far less bluffing or, or pretending to fight you you have an issue with somebody there wasn't much pushing around it was like straight away i remember once the, um, in eastern europe if you don't get the, the the grades you flunk the year and you have to repeat the whole year so you would be often with guys that have flunked it two or three times and they were like teenage boys and you would be in the same class as them so they would usually be kind of the the the, the expendables the teacher would give up on them and put them at the back of the class yeah. where they would mess around and they would they'd, they'd have a ruler they'd roll up a, a ball on the ruler and uh, and then basically aim <laughs> that, that some of them could actually get a, a fly off the window they were yeah. that good at aiming that and i remember uh, Boom. <laughs> back of my head once and this guy was just laughing I remember his name was Rooster and uh, the teacher said and I turned around and I lamped him and the teacher said right stop it you two the break came on he said when I come back I expect you to have sorted it all I remember the breaks were about 40 minutes he came in and he's still at it and we were still at it 40 <laughs> minutes that's all I can remember I yeah. don't know who won <laughs> it was just <laughs> a bunch of exchanges and white flashing lights yeah. <laughs> So uh, it was, it was, there was no uh, bluffing. There was what you do, what do you do that for right afterwards? It was like just 
boom, yeah. straight in there, yeah. you see. And there was far less that, that Eastern European. And then there was no going to your parents, oh, he duffed me up. He said, what do you mean he duffed you up, right? You know, go back and do it again. Do it. So it was expected of you. It's a different world. There wasn't much negotiation. It was done, but that's how you got respect bit by bit by bit. Yeah. You got the, the, the reputation, the, the, the respect more. I think it was more like a, a process of testing. And uh, which here, which I found here in the schools, there was far more pushing and shoving. And, 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 I, and I don't know whether that's uh, because they're not really allowed to do it. They get into trouble yeah. if they do that, you see. So that was the initial kind of thing. But in general, there's a there's a, a more kind of hands-on culture over there where they expect the kids to do that. Here, probably adults kind of slowly filter out and the ones that are that way will just do it anyway. Hence, I think maybe why there is such a bully regime in this country because they don't want to cross that line well, but, of... But it's it's a modern one in the old days, you, you know, uh, it's they would get boxing rings. It's, it's a lot of schools would do boxing. It was on the curriculum. You know, and what I find when I taught at schools wrestling, I'm a uh, wrestling coach, I taught for quite a while in schools. It was very good for the psychology of the younger, the, the nerdy kids, because uh, uh, fighting ability doesn't necessarily reflect on just aggression. No. Some people are, are born fighters, they don't even know it because their temperament is meek, but they're agile, they can move well, intelligent. but they're intelligent, but they never put it to at the test. So when you have something like, let's say wrestling in, in, the, in the school, and these kids are a little bit intimidated and the, the cock of the class thinks he's going to assert himself. Rules in, in, in wrestling, completely nothing to do with grabbing you and shaking you and, and being aggressive. So suddenly these meek kids under, under tutelage and uh, a controlled environment suddenly allowed to fight back and uh, they start doing better than, uh, very often than the bullies. And what I observe is that the, the bullies are in shock, you know, when they get pinned and they're just suddenly, yeah. this kid that I've been still like pesching and, and ragging around for, for months, if not for years, suddenly, boom, straight on the floor because his aggression doesn't reflect on his fighting ability. Typical bully. He's typical bully, you see. Yeah. So it resets the balance in the class. And then after that kid leaves, the meek kid leaves the wrestling class, you know what? Maybe I can, so like, I can be I, I, I could be somebody, yeah. defend it. And it, the, it doesn't turn them into bullies, but what it does turn them into confident kids. And the teachers were marvelled. He said yeah. that the wrestling has really changed the dynamics of the class. Yeah. Yeah. And same thing I presume would be in boxing as well. I think it should be brought back. Well, some sort um, of so like, uh, combat sport for, for the, the kids in school, it, it does. So like give people that confidence, which I think is the biggest problem of youngsters today. Definitely. And I from what I've found, Rad, the younger the pupil, yeah. the deeper the sponge. Yeah, that's they right. They just take so much more it's, in. It's, 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 it's spiritual. It's not just, you know, the, the people looking at it from the outside said it's, oh, it's violence, it's aggression. It's not, it's no. spiritual. We were, once we were hunter-gatherers, hunters yeah. primarily, you know, and, and that is still programmed in us. We have not genetically changed in 40, so 250,000 years. We're still pretty much Chrome magnon mixed with Neanderthal. So that's in us, that, that prime directive. And when that prime directive is, you know, you, you, you go to a zoo and you see a polar bear pacing up and down, you see a lion, despondent lion yeah, like that. Yeah, right? yeah. The spirit has gone. Tortured. The spirit has gone. But well, modern society is designed to break the spirits of young boys primarily, and probably girls as well. And that's why they medicate so many kids. Oh, he's got HDHD, he's got this, he's got that. Yeah. Here's a tablet, here's a tablet. Take it, sedate, yeah. sedate, sedate. And what do you get? You get so like a kid that can't function, that something's missing, he's angry. He's, he's, he's totally dependent yeah. on the government. And, and, then they, and then the government then makes nice big modern jails. Yeah. <laughs> so that yeah, 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 package yeah, yeah. them in there. Yeah, that's what they do. This, <clears throat> this is the power for society now. But anyway, let's go back to the early years, Rad. So you landed in... About 12 years old. So, yeah, I landed in uh, Hansard. So I grew up there and I was starting to so, like, just be a typical boy, you know, you know, learn to hang out with. It was a rough area. It was a, a financially deprived area. So um, I just hung out. So my mom had uh, two choices uh, to send me back to Serbia, which she didn't want to, or to um, get me into boarding school. So I went to a boarding school in Wolverhampton, the Royal Wolverhampton Boarding School which was an experience in itself. Um, it was very different. Strict. It was strict and there was a lot of us bullying there as well, which uh, again, made me step up and, and so like, 
kind of resist and fight and you know I wasn't a, I wasn't a group player I was always a loner you yeah. see I, I mean, it's not that I was a loner that I wanted to be on my own like so but I didn't like to follow anything that I didn't deem um, practical to follow yeah I, I got this kind of individuality where I thought well I'm not going to do it just because you're doing it if it's no interest of mine so I was kind of always on the fringes of having nerdy friends nice guys but uh, I like their company more rather than the jocks because yeah, they yeah, were yeah. always showing off and proving things but if, but if I was pushed I would retaliate and, and fight you know quite vigorously <laughs> <laughs> so when would you say you first entered into your sport of choice well but, but the biggest thing is I've, I was genetically very skinny very skinny, literally. I, I think I've got a... Usually the worst fuck is going. <laughs> it's not the big lumps I will look out for. That's it. I was very skinny and I thought I was cursed to literally be like... I mean, I remember at boarding school, every end of year, they would weigh us and, and measure our height. And all I remember is I was about 15, 15 a few months, seven stone one. I remember looking at the report, I, this is just undoable seven stone one at 15 years of age i mean i just can't fathom it how tall i was i was approaching about six foot six foot maybe a little bit under six foot i reached my full height about 17 so i presume i was about six foot a little bit under but very very skinny seven stone i remember the teacher taking a measurement and it was around my knee around the, the around the thigh they'd, they'd, they'd measure you to go on the report and the biggest measurement was around my knee <laughs> the thigh. So uh, literally, you know, it was a day. So as soon as I get the chance, there was a, a young uh, teacher came from one of the universities, Mr. Becky, and I would go and watch him train in the, in the sports hall. He had some sort of old, so like 1950s weights, and he would do a little weight training club. And I said, sir, can I join? He said, I've already got two lads uh, training with me. So, uh, so I used to just go in there and watch. And then bit by bit, the lads would so, like, find some other entertainment and drop off. And I said, sir, uh, so and so hasn't turned up. Can I join? He said, yeah, come, come on then. And I stuck it to the very last day of boarding school. And if I, for some unknown reason, I, I missed the session, I'll go and do two sessions. The following day. The, the following day. Yeah. To, to make up for the one I missed yeah. consecutively. That's how determined I was to. And it started to work. You know, I mean, I didn't know anything about diet. Uh, Boarding school, you had three meals a day and you were primarily hungry all the time. Yeah. So I remember we'd, we'd get a loaf of bread in the big long tables and we used to call them chucks. It was past me a slice, chuck up, right? Yeah. <laughs> so at uh, uh, six or seven o'clock when we'd have our last meal, thinking we got to bed at nine and then we don't eat until the next day. What am I going to do? So I get these chucks, bread and butter, jam. Every single pocket, every single pocket, literally, every single pocket, because you got this ravenous hunger. Obviously, I was training, I didn't know anything, obviously, 15, growing like, 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 I'm thinking, I, I'm, I'm just literally, when that hunger hits you, you look like, no, I'm eating anything. So, uh, and the worst case occasion, the prefects would be out on the exit. What have you got in your pockets? Have you taken food out? You're not allowed because you encourage rodents. Empty your pockets. Oh, please, please don't show me what size it is. <laughs> and the prefects, they would be on the lads as well. They would be, be, they would be high, high, uh, high age uh, lads. See. From different houses, we'd have uh, four or five different houses. Yeah. And so, the, the prefix from my house gone in that through, but uh, from other houses, put it back, put it back. Please, yeah. please. <laughs> let me keep one. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, the biggest thing then, that was hunger. I didn't know nothing about nutrition, but uh, I was slowly putting on size and weight and big work, and then from there, I, I literally never stopped training. You know, always some form of training, wasn't it? So that was about 30, 40. Yes, 13, uh, 14, uh, no, before, I started training about 14, 14, 15. So what, how old were you when you left school? I was kind of like confused. I, I didn't really um, do academically very well. I wasn't engaged, I, I didn't, my, my spirit wasn't, I could not sit down. I became super hyperactive. I just, you know, while people were studying, I was looking out the window, wanting to, to like run through the fields. Yeah. So I never really saw, I thought I'm gonna go back to Serbia. Um, Staying in my fight for a bit. I was getting so like irritating my mom and my grandmother, and so I went there. I was there for about a year. Uh, went back, 
in Eastern Europe, there was nothing at the time. Communism was just about collapsing. There wasn't much prospects. Mm -hmm. Working on mines or mills or something like that. There wasn't much. So after a year spending a year there, I decided to come back. I got my own place, started uh, training um, in Temple Gym, met Dorian, yeah. and uh, a good friendship ever since. You know, I went to California with him. He was like, I watched his rides from being just a, a local, so I bought a that's feeling better and being at and So, you know, it's. Uh, so, your journey in your teenage years, Rad, there must have been crossroads when you could have went down for one part. There were, but it was quite eye-opening. My, my, I carry my grandfather's name. Uh, my grandfather was a First World War veteran. But what I've noticed about people that are successful in combat is that they control their emotions. What I noticed about Leon for instance, he was very calm, very, very respectful. And uh, he never kind of was high or low in his emotions. He was always even killed, always turned up for training, trained very hard. Very, uh, so you think there's a lot of genetic potential there, but it's also psychological potential. And what made the same as Fedor Evilenko, he was a very good fighter at the time, very calm, collecting, very focused. So when you look at some of the greatest fighters, it's the psychology of all that makes them not just their genetic risk, but yeah, definitely. Definitely, the psychological state is, I think, not the percent of it is the fight. Very much, it is. It's, Basically, go out there and try to imagine that Muhammad Ali never went to the boxing gym, got a, uh, a job in a factory somewhere, never trained. They think he would have any slight so like, no, stand out from the crowd. I didn't a normal guy. So, this sort of, you know, this is basically your mindset that preempts your, your outcome and you've got to switch. Yeah. And you, so, nutrition, really. Nutrition mindset. N nutrition is the bonding agent. It bonds everything together yeah. because when you train hard, like last night I finished uh, wrestling, uh, got home, exhausted, but really in exhaustion, really good feeling. It's like a dopamine. Yeah. Uh, I went and I got 500 grams of the lamb's heart, chopped it up, fried it in a, a cast iron uh, fry pan, consumed. And you used. Will you use stats with the Yes, uh, I will use uh, beef tallow is the best meat. And coconut fat, if you want to be the uh, stay uh, vegetable, but the best one is beef tallow. Grass fed, grass fed beef tallow. So I have a good butcher and I go to him and I get so like a, a mince matrix where I get uh, three kilos of shin beef, a kilo of beef tallow, and puts that in, minces it up, and a kilo of liver. And I have this kind of meat matrix which has got minerals, nutrients, every kick in there. Uh, primarily, I consume that once or twice a day, ah, a big meal. But I don't really try to eat till about four or five o'clock. In the morning, I get up, I'll have a coffee, and I'll put a bit of uh, butter in there, a bit of coconut fat, cappuccino, I'll make it myself. So what's an average day's nutrition for you? It's, it's primarily uh, try to eat uh, one big meal and uh, as, uh, don't have snacks. So every time you snack, you're raising your insulin if you have, if you have a, a granola bar or something like that. And the modern syndrome of Western problem is insulin spiking every couple of hours up and down, up and down. So eventually your cells stop reacting to insulin. And when that happens, you become insulin sensitive. When you become insulin sensitive, all the diseases start creeping in. Your arteries start furring up. You start getting um, fatty liver, pre-diabetic, low energy, bad health. And then that compounds. You become less mobile. Oh, I'm too tired. I need to put my feet up. I'm exhausted. And so it kind of, it's a spiral of the slow degeneration. So the trick is not to become insulin sensitive. And the only way to avoid that, after 40, what you've eaten and what you've got away with as a, as a young man, you, young person, you, you can't. You have to readjust your consumption of carbohydrates. And uh, once you do that, you will suddenly have a huge abundance of, uh, of energy, yeah. And it's not just energy for you. Oh, your brain works quicker. That you don't have that kind of uh, fog. Oh, I'm tired. Of yeah. I can't concentrate. You know, I'm exhausted. You're sharp. You 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 are enthusiastic. Your your whole persona works in its optimum state. So uh, it's it's uh, it's. I want to just tell people because it, you kind of discover this, and um, you actually just discovered it, Rand. You studied it. I've studied it and I've implemented it. The, 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 the experiment is me. I mean, I, 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 the best kind of thing, I've implemented it. And I remember having a debate with uh, 
does does a bow tick because he went down the vegan path and I went down the cutting part. And uh, he was like, because uh, of the training he wanted to, and veganism is promoted as a healthy diet, so he kind of think that way. And uh, eventually he said, well, we're going to find out. One of us, you're going to find out. And uh, well, no, actually not going to be here as well. Because if I got this wrong, put it this way, I'm furry the way out because I'm going to be. So I know I've been up about 11 years, been doing this. Uh, I had a blood test some years ago, and after that, it, uh, the triglycerides were so low that the, 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 on, on the report said um, starvation diets and triglycerides, the, the, the triglycerides, which are primarily what further up your actions, they said it was the equivalent of somebody who was fasted for a very long time. That's how long the triglycerides were. So cholesterol in itself is not hard because you have good cholesterol. Not quite really. Yeah. The, the furring occurs when quickly explain it. Inside our vascular system, we have a membrane called endothelium. It's a little membrane. And when we have sugar, sugar burns this endothelium. So the body creates, secretes a sticky white stuff to protect the endothelium arm on a layman's term, right? So when you eat fat, fat doesn't irritate the, the arteries. So the body uses it as energy, doesn't store it. When you eat sugar, the body has to produce insulin very quickly to remove it out of the blood system there because it's burning. Yeah. Basically, acid is burning the, yeah. the endothelium. So if you're constantly eating sugar, it's constantly burning, and the body starts secreting a protective foam, like a fiery tidal foam, to around the veins. Around the veins, and it starts started furring and furring and furring. And that is the real cause of furring of the arteries, high carbohydrate sugar content, you see. So once you stop eating carbs and you up your fats, the body just keeps it in the circulatory system. You don't feel hungry. It doesn't store it. It just uses your as energy. And so you just have a lot more energy. You don't feel hungry. You don't feel peckish. Yeah, less injury. Less injuries. You're not inflamed. The water, you drop about half a stone to a stone of water because uh, for every one gram of carbohydrate you consume, you need four to five grams of water to dilute the sugar because you don't look at carbs as acid. They are the carbon-based sides. But the body needs water retention to dilute it. So a lot of people are not actually fat. They're inflamed. They're highly inflamed. You know, to see around the, the throat area. Round under their arm, yeah. their inflammation. Water retention is a survival mechanism for the body to protect itself. Otherwise, the sugar as acid would wreck the body. And that's why diabetics who can't process the sugar end up getting uh, uh, amputated uh, toes, legs. Yeah. They go blind yeah. because the sugar ha it's not being removed and it's ended up burning and destroying the, the capillaries, the small little uh, uh, blood supply to the fringes of your body, like your toes, your uh, an optic nerve. And the sad thing, they don't. Because they are, they don't, well, they, they don't, they don't want us, they don't want us to know. I remember telling you a story some years ago, about five, six years ago, I went back to Serbia. Oh. And I told you about my cousins, they were all, well, my, uh, one of my oldest cousins, he was my inspiration because he was always into weight training and, you know, special forces soldier, very strong character. And I went to, his name is Zoran. So I said, I went to, where's Zoran? Oh, he's in hospital. What do you mean he's in hospital? Oh, he's got, he's in diabetic hospital. Diabetic hospital. And just, I was already on a keto diet myself. And just before uh, I went to Serbia, I bought a book from America, to, uh, Fat for Fuel by Dr. McCullough. Right. I'm going to finish up with just a little bit of advice, Rapid. You could get to the next generation coming through. Just, you know, an ugly kid now stood on a street corner on the cusp of crime, wanting to drift in with a gang. Uh, just pick a little knife or gun. What advice would you give to a kid right now? Go, go through to a, find a nice mirror on your own. Nice big mirror on your own. And look at this thing. And ask yourself a question, one question. And am I a follower? Am I a follower? Because doing something that all that you were, you were the sum of all your ancestors, sum of all your ancestors, a lot of your ancestors were in the trench, and a lot of your ancestors were fighting various wars for principles freedom, whatever it is, are you going to forsake everything that did, they did for an immediate gratification, for a bit of pleasure that in the long run will cost you everything you want and probably children because you won't be the woman you're meant to meet. That's right. Because you've been the clinker or in the nick. And that. You want out souls that are meant to come through you because of that immediate gratification. You owe it not to, to yourself, but to all the people before you and all the people that are going to come out happy. Um, yeah. And you have to have, you do need for them, and you have to have that strength.
just visualize their faces. And so there's no better feeling than knowing you've got your kids in a home that they're so like well looked after. You put the key in that door, it's true, third it's true, you don't look left and right. And it's it's that faith, yeah. the strength of character and that it will make that's what makes true strength yeah. resisted temptation. Yeah, it's so much out there. Oh, 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 oh,